Well, good day, everybody. It's Russ Barkley. I'm back again with yet more commentary on ADHD. Today, I want to address a topic that many of my subscribers have written me about, asking for more clarification on the relationship of ADHD with anxiety and its disorders. So let's tee this up and let's take a good look at what is going on in this relationship. Now, first up, we know that ADHD and anxiety are related to each other rather strongly, in fact. In childhood, children with ADHD have about a 20 to 25 percent risk of developing an anxiety disorder. But when followed up to adulthood, or when we see adults who are self-referred to clinical practices in adulthood, we see that the relationship is as high as 45 to 50 percent of those adults with ADHD have an anxiety disorder by adulthood. So something's going on between ADHD and anxiety, and especially over time and development between these two disorders that we need to take a closer look at. It's, it's an interesting uh, relationship, to some extent bi-directional, but we'll talk about that in just a minute. So is there a relationship? Clearly there is. High rate of comorbidity. Why? Well, let's understand that ADHD, of course, leads to its own symptoms of inattention, primarily distractibility, but also poor concentration, poor follow through on tasks, forgetfulness in getting things done on a daily basis. But ADHD's inattention is primarily outwardly directed. The individual is overly coupled to and engaged with environmental events. That's an important distinction, as you'll see in a moment. And of course, ADHD is related to its hyperactive and impulsive symptoms. So this is pretty straightforward stuff here that you can find in the DSM-5. Now, what you may not recall is that ADHD also has about a 50% overlap with another attention disorder. So while they're not the same, they are often comorbid, and that is cognitive disengagement syndrome, what used to be called sluggish cognitive tempo, or SCD, now renamed in 2022 as CDS. Please see my other videos on CDS on my channel for much more detail. But in any case, the inattention that occurs in CDS is very different. The individual is overly engaged with or coupled with mental events, as in daydreaming, mind wandering, rumination. And during these periods of excessive internally preoccupied attention, the individual is often somewhat hypoactive, sluggish to respond, and may even indeed make more errors in processing information because they're not engaged with the environment and so they'll make mistakes when it comes to questions about what happened around them. So CDS is more internally preoccupied, ADHD externally preoccupied. I hope that helps you. Now, when we look at ADHD's connection to anxiety, we can see that, as I've said, over time, people with ADHD become increasingly likely to develop anxiety and its disorders, especially social phobias, but other anxiety problems as well. And the longer ADHD goes untreated across time, and this includes adults, the greater the odds at follow-up that they will have an anxiety disorder. So ADHD appears to be contributing to the risk for anxiety. There's a causal relationship here to some extent, not perfectly, because you can have anxiety disorders without ADHD, but ADHD, when it's present, certainly increases the odds you're going to develop anxiety symptoms and possibly an anxiety disorder and most likely social phobia. Now, when ADHD links up with anxiety and uh, its symptoms, we often see that it's the cognitive disengagement symptoms that anxiety is most related to. Even when it doesn't occur with ADHD, CDS is the most likely attention disorder that goes with anxiety. 
And when anxiety and ADHD team up together, we also see much greater impairments in daily life activities. There's also an increasing risk for suicide. Uh, that's often because ADHD, uh, excuse me, anxiety goes with depression and depression increases suicidal thinking and the impulsivity of ADHD increases the likelihood of a suicide attempt. Also, recent research shows that where ADHD and anxiety coexist, there's a small but elevated risk of developing schizophrenia in that subset of individuals. Now, let's return to the question I just asked. Why is it that ADHD over time might increase the risk of anxiety? Well, let's take a look at the next slide. And here you're going to see that ADHD is associated with problems with emotion regulation. And that means that even everyday stressors and even typically anxiety eliciting events in daily life that we all encounter are going to cause more problems for people with ADHD. They're more likely to experience anxiety in association with stress and anxious eliciting events because of their executive function deficits and mainly the area of executive functioning we know as emotional self-regulation. So ADHD has a link to mild anxiety through these executive deficits. And the, of course, difficulties with coping with these anxiety-inducing situations that all of us are likely to encounter. Now, secondly, we see that ADHD also has a link to anxiety through the cumulative failure experience in life that go with ADHD over time when it is unmanaged. The more ADHD is unmanaged, the more people are going to experience impairment in daily life activities. They're going to experience many adverse consequences, including failure consequences. And guess what that does? It generates anticipatory anxiety around just those situations, whether that's related to work, whether it's related to getting along with other people, whether it's related to intimate partner relationships. You can think about all the major domains of life and if ADHD is increasing adverse consequences in them, it doesn't take long for people to develop a sort of anticipatory fear when it comes to entering those situations the next time. So we have ADHD through its poor emotional self-regulation leading to some mild anxiety symptoms, and we have the failure experiences and other adversities that ADHD generates that are going to feed back to increase anticipatory anxiety and fear about those failure situations. Now, the classic symptoms of anxiety are not likely to be provoked by ADHD. Here we're talking about excessive worry, that it's, it's unwarranted. It's not like the worry I just talked about that comes from failure. This is excessive worrying that has no justification with everyday events. Oh, I just noticed, sorry about that typo on every day there. Uh, also, ADHD is not going to induce panic attacks, such as the rapid onset of nausea, vomiting, heart pounding, uh, and the sense that one can't breathe uh, as well. So classic panic attacks don't seem to be provoked by ADHD. Uh, and then, of course, there's fear of situations and places, such as fear of open spaces, as in agoraphobia. ADHD isn't so much related to that, but it is related to social phobias, as I've said, and, and then excessive fear of social situations. So ADHD by itself can create mild anxiety due to poor self-regulation of emotion, can also create anticipatory anxiety over cumulative failure and adversity, but it's not likely to lead to classic anxiety symptoms. That is going to come from anxiety. Now, how are we going to manage this? Well, interestingly, the traditional ADHD therapies that you see listed here, such as cognitive behavior therapy targeting the executive function deficits, ADHD medications, ADHD coaching, and even mindfulness-based practices are going to help with those mild anxiety symptoms due to poor emotion regulation. So yeah, some ADHD therapies actually can help to quell 
some mild anxiety symptoms, provided that they're secondary to ADHD and its EF deficits. We also know that ADHD therapies are going to also be useful for dealing with the anticipatory anxiety that came from cumulative failure from having ADHD. And that's because the ADHD therapies are going to make the person more competent, more effective, more successful by lowering their ADHD symptoms, by helping address their executive function symptoms. There's going to be fewer and fewer adverse consequences and failures in life and more successes. And that's going to help to quell that kind of anxiety that's linked to ADHD. But we're not going to see ADHD therapies doing much for classic symptoms of anxiety. And in that case, we're going to need to target classic anxiety disorders with classic anxiety-focused therapies, such as traditional cognitive behavior therapy that focuses more on identifying emotional eliciting events, anxiety eliciting events specifically, and how to address them through changes in cognition, changing how we think that changes the risk of emotional sequelae with that. We're going to need to institute anti-anxiety medications, uh, which aren't going to do anything for ADHD, but would help with classic anxiety. Here we might introduce mindfulness meditation, not just the mindfulness-based everyday practices that Lydia Zylowska and John Mitchell talk about in their book for managing adult ADHD. I'm talking about more traditional mindfulness meditation that might be used here for anxiety as well. And then let's understand that PTSD might well be occurring in conjunction with anxiety, and it's going to require its own therapies as well. So I hope you can understand that the relationship of ADHD to anxiety is very complex, very complicated, but we can break it down this way and get a very good understanding of what to expect from each disorder, why ADHD increases anxiety over time, what kinds of inattention go with each of these disorders, and what kinds of therapies we're going to need to address the three levels of anxiety that you see on the right-hand side of this slide. So I hope that you can see that there is a strong relationship between the two disorders and that we can do something about them. And oh, by the way, there's a couple of recent papers that show that treating even classic anxiety disorder symptoms can feed back to improve ADHD to some extent, because some of the inattention in ADHD is due to anxiety, probably that cognitive disengagement syndrome I talked about on the previous slide. All right, thanks for joining me, everybody, for this slide or for this slide presentation. Uh, I hope you found it useful. As always, thanks for subscribing to the channel. If you're not a subscriber, think about becoming one. If you know somebody who can benefit from this channel, I'd appreciate you recommending it to them as well. And as always, when I sign off, I say, what? Be well, live well, take care, and bye for now.